This is your host, Mitchell J. Rabin, and we're very glad you're joining us again today. Today we're going to have another very interesting show. We have with us a very dear friend, Sudaji, who I have known for a number of years now. We met at a holotropic breath conference, actually, where we were both working on our inner life to come to a place of greater height, greater clearing, greater inner resolution for purposes of greater evolution. Since then, uh, both of us actually at different times and some at the same time have been in Golden City, India at the Oneness University. And Sudaji has gone through a very wonderful, very interesting transition that on A Better World, we love to show people, we love to model the way people go through transitions and shift their lives for the good, coming from any number of different places to come to a place of greater radiance, greater sense of happiness. And Sudaji very much embodies that in her story about her life, which she'll be sharing with us today. So my dear Sudaji, so good to see you. So good to see you too, Mitchell. Truly. As always. <laughs> I know. Good. So it's mm -hmm. so interesting to have known you over these years and to watch your transformation, really, your upper outward evolution. Mm -hmm. Give us a little idea of what was going on with you in your life prior to your going to Golden City and to Oneness University. How would you describe? Because then you were a channel. You were very psychically inclined, and you're very intuitive just by birth, I think. Yes. And yet you've also seen yourself go through a really interesting expansion and evolution. Describe to us what it is you went through. Well, kind of where you started <laughs> and where you see yourself now. Before in 2005, I was very depressed and very suicidal. Like through the course of the years, I was dealing with a lot of depression, a lot of anger, and a lot of anxiety, and a lot of fear. And I tried to take my life three times. And, and you didn't succeed. No, I didn't <laughs> succeed. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> succeed. Yeah. And I was very angry that I didn't succeed. <clears throat> but I always wanted to end my pain, and I thought ending the pain would mean ending the body. And I've done a lot of work. I mean, I've traveled around to meet many people to help me with ending the emotional pain. And I tried to do many different things, going to many different workshops, seminars. Was it primarily emotional pain you were suffering from or emotional and physical pain? Emotional and physical pain. Cause I had you had hurt yourself in an yes. accident. Yes. I had a lot of surgery on my right leg, and my leg was almost amputated twice. Mm. And I dealt with a lot of anger and resentment as a female dealing with, and as a person dealing with so much pain and didn't know how to end the pain physically nor emotionally. So I've read a lot of books. I've done a lot of workshops. Self-help books, self-development. Exactly, exactly. Both practical, psychological, as well as Spiritual, I take it. Yes, right. and also seeing a psychiatrist. I was seeing two psychiatrists, and they wanted to put me on antidepressants. But <coughs> through being a medium, I, something kept telling me not to do that. And I wanted to do it, but I didn't do it. So I kept seeking and seeking. I was so passionate about wanting to get out of the pain. Naturally, I mean, nobody wants, I mean, pain is a, sin, a signal to the person, basically to their soul, to shift something, to change something, you know, on the highest level. On the physical level, it's ouch, but on the emotional and spiritual levels, it's something needs to be changed, something needs to be seen, perhaps. Well, it was more deeper than that because I felt like the pain was my identity. I oh, felt like the pain represented- It had become that. Right, mm -hmm. I felt like the pain was more about I wasn't beautiful enough, I wasn't good enough, I wasn't going to be successful enough. It felt like it just took a whole wind of my identity of mm -hmm. self that I felt like I was drowning in it. 
that the pain was more than anything I could ever handle. It was just my whole sense of who I thought I was was not there. It was just drowning. It was just the pain, physically and emotionally. Mm. So the only thing I could really think to do was just to end my life. I didn't want to truly die, but I just wanted the pain to end. You knew of no other solution? No, because I felt at the time I've tried everything. You know, like reading all these books, positive thinking, going to other people's workshops. And other people's workshops were very good, but mm -hmm. it didn't, it helped me to a point, but it didn't help me to that point where I stopped feeling that ache, that yearning, that that was this deeper part of me that was yearning for something more. And I did not know what that something was. But it, when it came, I would know it. And that's when I went to India. This speaks really, I think, for so many people mm -hmm. because on one level or another, Sudaji, people are experiencing pain. And sometimes it's physicalized, yeah. and sometimes it is just this anxiety, this agita, this nervousness, this sometimes depressiveness. Yes. Um, it's an existential pain of what the Buddhists refer to as confusion and ignorance. Yes. And <laughs> it's one of the three poisons. <laughs> these are the two of the three poisons, yes. you know, yes. and avarice. Yes. And these things are, are consuming. And until someone finds the, you know, the balm of the mm -hmm. spiritual view or something beyond themselves, they are, as you said, consumed by and yeah. swallowed by this, this pain. So mm -hmm. I think everyone can relate to the story you're telling. But then tell us what happened. <laughs> well, I built a you house. Heard about, um, right. You heard about uh, India. You heard about Golden City. Well... I had a dream, let me go back. I always thought that society tells us to, to find the spouse, to build the house, to get the money, and I achieved all that, but I still was not happy. And then, a couple of nights ago, in February of 2005, way a couple of nights ago, um, I had a dream. First, Jesus Christ came to me in a dream, and he was playing with my feet. And then a week later, this man appears in dressed in all gold. And there were all these people dressed in white, but I didn't know who this man was. It was I can't even describe the unconditional love that was coming from this being in the dream. And then the very next day, um, Rena and you, Mitchell, were coming over my house for dinner. And all of a sudden, my center of my chest opened. That's the only way I can really explain it. It felt like this huge opening that was happening in the center of my chest. It was very powerful and beautiful. And I was sobbing. I was just sobbing uncontrollably. And I kept speaking about awakening and enlightenment. But I really didn't know what that truly meant. And then you said to me that you had interviewed someone in India named Bhagava. And I knew that instant, I knew, I don't know how I knew, but I knew I had to go. Well, you watched the video. We brought you uh, one of the DVDs of the interview that you were watching. Later you brought me the, the DVD. We had just come back from India, actually. Yes, yes. We had gone through uh, one of the original processes there. Yes. Yeah. But the decision that I knew about to go to India was way before I even saw the video. Mm. I knew that I, I knew that I had to go. I knew that I was going. And then I, you gave me the phone number to speak to Rani G. I spoke to Rani. I've never received a Diksha or a Oneness Blessing. And then I booked everything, and then I saw your video. But I, had, I wasn't even on the internet trying to research Bhagavan. It was such a deep knowing that it's beyond words. It felt like I was being pulled to go. 
And when I watch your beautiful video, which you've done a beautiful job, I saw Bhagavan, and it really didn't even hit me that it was him in my dream. And then when I got to India uh, in March of 2005, I knew once I arrived in what is called DC2, the Golden City, and I saw this picture of him, I knew it was the same man in my dream. And when I sat in front of this picture, these golden balls came out of the picture and they came inside of me in my heart. Like these, these golden balls were coming out of the picture, which they called the Shri Mukti. And, it, and I didn't know what it meant. And I'm sitting in the back of the room waiting for the program to start. And these golden balls come out of the picture and they enter into me. And it was amazing. It was you went through quite a powerful process. For those of you who may not know, there is a process known as the 21-day process in yes. Golden City where people go through a series of dikshas. And let's explain what that is, too. As well as a first initial clearing, which is called Samskara Shudi, which is an internal, I call it um, Indian uh, primal screen therapy because that's what I think they're modeling themselves on. And essentially, it's a way of clearing the psyche, clearing the emotional life and the body. So there can be more, it's like emptying the vessel in a way. Well, when I received my, when I received the first diksha and Aman Bhagavan came to me in the images, through the whole 21 day, as Mitchell spoke about, the whole process Every diksha, every one of blessing was mystical. It was beautiful. It was so intense and so wonderful. I can't even find words to explain. You know, and the mind was still acting, but then all of a sudden, just this mystical experience just shifted. And when I flew back home, I really didn't know what happened, or if anything really happened. <clears throat> but when I came home, I realized I had no pain in my leg, in my surgery leg that was almost amputated. Mm. I could hop. And you had had pain in that leg I had pain in my for leg. most of your adult life, almost, yes, since the accident, yes, certainly. Yes, from 1991 until 2004 really close to 2005 until I came back from India. I couldn't sit cross-legged. I couldn't have anybody touch it. I couldn't wear shoes or socks. It, it basically controlled my life. And the emotional level when I came back from India, my mind or the mind was totally silent. It was I would watch a movie, just naturally going to the movies, and sitting in the audience watching a movie, movie, there was no chatter. Before I used to have, oh, you're not good enough, oh, your life is hard, oh, you're, you're ugly or whatever. My mind used to always kept racing. All sorts racing. of stories. Yes. So many stories. Exactly. <clears throat> but I could just totally be watching the movie with nothing, total silence, deep silence. And then when I eat, I would just eat. Just being present. Yes. <laughs> exactly. This is the gig. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's very beautiful. I can see also with you over this time uh, such a beautiful quieting an inner peace if you will and an outer radiance all together in one it's so beautiful to see i'm so glad <laughs> that you went and you did what you did and since you also then brought your wonderful husband gary yes. who went and he went through the process as well yes. so you have this to share together yes I'd like people to also know about this uh, wonderful thing that we're going to be naming this uh, interview. 
which is funny. You don't look enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a wonderful, <clears throat> why don't you share the project with people? When I <clears throat> came back from India, I wrote a 21-day process, and then we gave a program and to help other people, <coughs> but it's really going to India that will help people to go, to give to Diction, but to help people to clear the deep emotions. So my husband and I, Gary, we wrote a program and we're giving workshops called Funny You Don't Look Enlightened to help people by giving them the oneness blessing of the diksha to go into their inner process so that they can emerge out of their pain and their suffering, whether it's emotional or physical, but it is the divine presence that does the work. It's not Gary and I, we're just facilitating the work, sure. but it's the higher divine source that does everything. Of course. So it's a, it's a beautiful program. It's what Bhagavan also taps into. Yes. <laughs> Everybody taps into <laughs> this. <laughs> yes. That's the way it is yes. set up, yeah. And it's not even just Bhagavan, it's whatever faith that you believe in. So it's not someone believing in Amar and Bhagavan, it's whatever faith that you believe in, if you believe in Christ or Buddha, or even if you have no faith, the program is designed for anybody and everybody. So it's not about trying to bring or take someone away from their religion or change their religion. It's just whatever you believe in, you come and then this is a way to help you in your life, everyday life. It's not really about faith at all. And one can also have faith yes. in whatever it is they choose to have faith in. Exactly. But this isn't about faith. This is about one of the reasons actually I got interested at all is because Bhagavan talked about uh, this process called Diksha, which essentially we've been referring to it, so I should say that it is essentially an energetic trans uh, transmission. And some it's really something that we would refer to in a more religious context as grace. Yes. It's a higher level energy field that we have been given the ability to conduct through our body, through ourselves, to and share with another. So it's this beautiful thing. But he describes this process of diksha and the process of awakening as neurophysiological. And I think that it's had an effect and an, a reach into the Western world because of the predominant religion of the West, which is science. Mm -hmm. I know that's a funny way of putting it, but mm -hmm. it is. We believe inherently in science. And it's a belief. Yes. Not that science can't prove things. It can. But it, we have faith in it doing what it does, mm -hmm. and uh, right or wrong. And uh, his using language like that showed me and many people that there is this neurobiological process that occurs, a, a shifting in our neurons and our neurocircuitry mm -hmm. through receiving this, this beautiful grace. Yes. You know, yes. so it's kind of a beautiful merger, if you will, of, of science and spirituality, the way it's always been in India, mm -hmm. the art and science of spiritual living, and was once together in the West and got separated out at a certain point. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful process that can help everyone and anyone. If it can help me from being suicidal, depressed, anxiety, feeling overwhelmed, to physical pain, to having this total stillness, total deep, deep peace. Mm. It's something that I pray that everyone, no matter what your race, your religion, your belief, that everyone will experience to bring peace and joy and love and happiness in the world. Yeah, definitely. That's the dream of <coughs> creating an enlightened world, an enlightened planet. Yes. Where Now you not very long ago were in South Africa. Yes. Tell me about that. We went to, uh, well, I went to South Africa to help out to give the oneness blessing to many people. You met there with the Dasas. Yes. Those are the monks from India. Yes. And we went around to many orphanages and different religions and different places and gave the oneness blessing. And who did you give it to? Christians, Sufis. Sufis in South Africa? Yes. 
many, many people in South Africa. Did you go into some of the tribal lives and um, places? Some and of the people came to the retreats. Like they had different places where people came, like someone's home, we would go to people's homes or we'd go to people's villages or we would go have programs given at many different places. Mm. And the monks, the doctors, would speak to the people and we would give the women's blessing. And there's another event coming up very soon. Mm. So well, how was it received? I mean, what It was very people received. People truly were so grateful that we came and that they received the blessing. It was so well received, we had to turn people away. Like it was so, we had like 200, 300 people. And pretty soon they're going to have another one where 30,000 people will And you were turning people away at 300? Yes. What are you going to do with the other 29,000? Well, they're going <laughs> to have a bigger arena. <laughs> and more addiction givers, I hope. Yes, yes. <laughs> one would get a bit <laughs> tired. Well, we're going to do a pet addiction, which is just uh, transmitting the energy sure, as opposed touch. to putting our hands on their hands. Exactly. So it was Shoo. very <laughs> well received. Yeah. And even the little children, um, we gave the, the diksha and the oneness blessing to children, infants, and the children received it. I mean, oh my God, it was so amazing to see children 14, 15 who were left in the streets, who were abandoned, and now they were singing and dancing, and they forgave their mother and father. They had so much pain and suffering. And then a couple of days later, they called us and thanked us. Mm. It was so powerful to be able to touch an infant, or really to touch anybody's life. That grace comes in and transforms these people, consciousness. What's interesting is that it's so obviously not only cross-cultural, but transcultural. Yes. Yes. It is something received by people in the depths of Africa. Yes. You know, it doesn't matter. It goes transcends culture, yes. is what you're saying, and that's what you saw yes. up close, right? Yes. Up close and personal, so to speak. Yes, it yeah. was wonderful. Yeah. yeah. What experience have you had inside yourself or working with somebody else that you feel has been the most transformative? I mean, I know you've shared some, what I consider to be utterly beautiful and extraordinary things of just first the physical pain shifting. Mm -hmm. So it went from being always to not there. Has it stayed not there? Yes, it's, it's, not, been, it's not there. It's not part of your life. No. So it's a healing that took place through the process yes. of the 21 day and the yes. receiving diksha. But it should also be said that it's not just the receiving of diksha that goes on at the 21 day process or engagement with oneness university altogether. Bhagavan makes a big point, even though there are no real formal teachings, he makes a few very specific points and one of them is make up with your parents, especially your mother, and forgive and make peace and home. Deal with one's own shadow. Mm -hmm. That was another thing that actually brought me there because I felt he was so forthright about dealing, not just with the bliss component of the spiritual path, which is easy to deal with. Mm -hmm. Bliss, sure, I'll have more, please. But to deal with the other darker side, which is saying, look, we're all here for a reason. We all have karma. What's that about? Mm -hmm. And let's look at why we have these parents and what gift it is for them to bring us. What peace can we make or should we make with them before going to you know, make peace with the rest and for the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. It's very powerful, right? Yes. Well, for myself, with my own parents, I had some stuff going on with my mother. But Alma and Bhagavan, through the blessing, through grace, has removed that charge. Mm. So when I am experiencing my mom and dad now, I experience them just as they are. And it's so beautiful just to be in their presence no matter what they say, no mm. matter what they do. And just totally experience them and love them truly for who they are and just be in their presence. So it's about really healing all types of relationships. You know, yes, the mother and father was very important, but also 
relationship in the world and relationship with yourself. Absolutely. First and foremost, yes, you are right. (laughs) With oneself. And yet, as close to that is because we are actually made of our lineage becomes those who gave us life. You know, we were carried in the womb of our mother. We were one with her at one point. So you had an opportunity to really work that through and receive help, receive the grace of our yes, Bhagavan in that context. Definitely. No, your words are beautiful, Siddhaji, and I so appreciate it. As the old story says, you know, if we're not at home with ourselves and at peace with ourselves, how could we be with others? And the only way to really know if the Zen master is enlightened is ask his wife. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the wife who knows, <laughs> isn't it? It's a beautiful thing to know that grace is here helping mankind. It really exactly. is. Exactly. You know? It really is. I mean, the mind is still there, but knowing that the mind is not controlling you anymore, so you're just in total stillness and total peace and silence. Exactly. It is. Exactly. I want to thank you so much for coming onto the show. Thank you, Mitchell, and so much for having me. And to share this with the audience is truly a great thing that you're doing. And it's also a great thing that grace is here to help all of us. Mm, not just you, it? not just you, but all of us. Oh, sure. All so of us. thank you. Absolutely. Thanks so much for thank being you. here. This is Mitchell J. Rabin for A Better World. Thanks so much for joining us. And I look forward to seeing you all. <laughs>